Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come to you this morning and we ask for your word to penetrate the deepest parts of our hearts, to uncover the ways that we are wandering away from you and not towards you. Because, Lord, we know you are a God and Father who loves us and desires for us to know you and be known by you and to have joy that goes deeper than anything this world can offer. So please, open up our hearts, uncover the truth, and God, lead us to your joy. We ask you in your son Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I was driving here this morning, I had to stop by the gas station and fill up the gas because I tend to do this. I don't, I don't put the gas in when I need to, and then when I'm in a hurry somewhere, <laughs> I've got to stop and get the gas. So I did that again this morning. And as I was going to uh, fill up my tank with gas, I just started noticing, man, there's ads everywhere. I'm talking this, this morning at church. I'm preaching a sermon all about consumerism and how we are what we possess and what we buy. And just look, there's ads everywhere. And as I'm filling up uh, my, my gas tank, I notice, oh, there's a sign right in front of me to buy this thing. I notice uh, there's even a little sticker on the, the, the gas handle. Here, this is where you can buy this thing. And then as I'm pumping the gas, all of a sudden somebody starts talking to me. The gas TV is telling me that I need to get this. So, ah, wow, I was just like, yep, I, man, I need this sermon on consumerism. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, as, as, as we come this morning to this topic uh, of consumerism, just uh, where all of us might fall uh, in this cultural identity that is pervasive. Where, where are you maybe in this? And, and I want to acknowledge that we're at different places when it comes to this particular cultural movement, this, this kind of under current in our culture. Some of us, we we consider ourselves savers. We don't spend a lot of money, right? So we're kind of conservative on money. So that's one thing. And other of us, you know, it's like, no, I'm free with my money. If I want to buy something, I'll buy it. And I just want to say we're at different places in this. And I'm not speaking to whether you should be more of a saver or more of a spender. I'm speaking more to, hey, do you just live out of this identity that's really based in money and what you have? And is that sort of just driving a lot of your life uh, in, in a way that maybe you're not aware of. So I just want to invite you to be open to that. And if you think, you know, this really hasn't had much of an impact on me, well, let me ask you to just, just consider how many slogans and ads you have treasured in your heart, okay? Uh, I'll just give you a sampling, and I wonder how many of these you could identify. Some will be more, maybe more known. Maybe some will be more obscure. I'm not going to tell you the the company that these are. I don't want to, I don't want to um, promote these <laughs> companies for you, but I do want you to just, just see here. Uh, the first group is food, either places where you get food or food products. See, what, see if you know what these are. I'm loving it. Uh, here's another one. Obey your thirst. Snap, crackle, pop. Finger licking good. And I'm not sure which donuts we had in the lobby this morning, so no insult if this wasn't them, but America runs on, <clears throat> see, see, uh, here's some places, here's some places that we are, we are told we should go to. Um, this is the happiest place on earth, or where dreams come true. <laughs> that one's appropriate in some ways I won't even say right now. Uh, but <clears throat> here's another one. Save money, live better. Or if you don't go to that store, here's the other store you might go to. Expect more, pay less. All right. Uh, here are some just other categories that I, that I thought about. Um, this one's maybe a little bit more obscure, but I thought it was pretty, pretty good. The original. If your grandfather hadn't worn it, you wouldn't exist. And that's a cologne, if you're wondering, okay? <clears throat> yeah, okay. <clears throat> I'll let you work that one out. Uh, this one might be more of the newer generation. I hadn't heard this one before, but move the way you want. Move the way you want. That's, a, that's a, like a taxi service, a riding service that you can get. Move the way you want. Um, uh, this one is an older one. I'm sure you could probably sing the jingle. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's. Uh, and here's, here's not a product so much, uh, but a, a safety net, I might call it. You're in good hands with. 
<laughs> All right, and then one more uh, that really gets to the heart of our culture. There are some things money can't buy. And at first, that feels kind of good, right? Oh, yeah, I agree with that. But wait until the end. There are some things money can't buy for everything else. There's. So, <laughs> see, I, I think... Uh, you know, some of these slogans are so well-crafted, so good. They have just stayed in our hearts and minds for years. I mean, some of those I heard, you know, as a, as, as a little kid, and I still remember the jingles. Um, they make some pretty big claims, if you think about it. Some pretty big claims. I mean, the happiest place on earth? Really? Uh, <clears throat> And I mean, not that some of the, there, there's some truth in all of these things. We really do enjoy some of these products, some of these places, but they make some really big claims. And we have to ask, are they really true? Are they really true? The, the lies that we have to confront as followers of Jesus in a consumerist culture go really deep, really deep into our hearts. Here's, here's some of the lies that maybe are deep down underneath some of these catchy slogans. You really need to buy this. You really need to buy this. Or here's another one. You know what? You can do whatever you want with your money. It belongs to you. Do whatever you want with it. It's your money. You can have whatever money can buy. The world is your oyster. Just, you know, if you've got the money, why, why not get it? Or this one, uh, here's another lie. You, you shouldn't be limited from enjoying whatever you want as long as you can pay for it. This is the lie of money in our culture. Uh, your purchases don't hurt anyone. They always actually do good. They make you feel good, and then they're giving money to others you're paying for. They're always good for people. We'll look at that one more closely in a minute. And then this last one's a pretty big one. Just a little more, fill in the blank, and you'll be happy. Every single commercial is, is basically saying that. Just get this thing or go to this place. And then underneath all these lies is the one that gives the most fuel to consumerism, and that is the goal of life is to have as much of the world as we can, have as much good things to eat or to experience or do as we can. That's the consumer lie. Because the more we have and the more that we consume the more joy and fulfillment we'll have. We're hungry, so we should be filling that hunger, right? But according to God in the scriptures, the human being was created not to live off of even food or drink, but to live off of God himself. He is what we are made to live off of. Not clothing, shelter, as important those are, not food and drink, not chocolate cake, but God. God is what we hunger for. God told Moses, in the Old Testament, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus used the same language when he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. My flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. 300 years after Jesus, another follower of Jesus named Augustine wrote these famous words as a prayer in his autobiography. He wrote, praying to God, God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Our hearts are made to be happy in God. And so imagine if we could kind of start society over to start over our culture and build a society that's based on this truth that we are really happy in God, what would that society look like? What should all our production and consumption really aim to do? It should aim to direct us to God, to help us find him, because he's what our hearts most long for. Unfortunately, our consumerist society is not built on that foundation, and and what it really does is it doesn't give us anything in particular to aim for. You see, the basis of consumer society is simply consuming, and it really doesn't matter what it is. Just keep on consuming and taking in. William T. Cavanaugh in his book, Being Consumed, Economics and Christian Desire, says, when there is a recession, we are told to buy things to get the economy moving. 
What we buy makes no difference. All desires, good and bad, melt into the one overriding imperative to consume. And we all stand under the one sacred canopy of consumption for its own sake. Now, I want to say consuming is not evil in itself. We are actually made to consume. We have to eat. We have to drink. We have to have clothing. But consuming goes bad when it's for our own sake. And in American culture, we can say, see that this has happened. We can see that's happened in the waste, in the oppression, and in the ignorance that consumerism breeds. Just think about waste for a second. We have a lot of waste in our country and in our world. We have so much waste, in fact, that we actually have to ship it to other countries so that they can take our trash and also our recycling. Up until 2018, we were shipping a lot of our recycled materials to China because they had the ability to take in that material and then reuse it, recycle it. But they actually closed their doors to us in 2018 for lots of reasons, but that being one of them. So we have gone to other countries now to give them our recycling stuff that we, don't, we can't recycle. So there's a lot of waste. That's one sign that consumerism is, is pretty big in our culture. Another one is oppression. Oppression. Now, this, is, this one maybe is, is a harder one to see, but, but if you think about it, a jacket, this, this happens. You may go to a store and find a jacket that costs $75. Okay, nice jacket, right? And that jacket was sewn in another country. You can look on the tag, Vietnam maybe or Bangladesh. It's very likely that that woman who sewed that or that man who sewed that garment was working 16-hour days making as low as 55 cents an hour. That happens. And if you don't believe that, uh, just do a little research. It's pretty staggering. The bargain deals turn out sometimes to be made unjustly. So we see waste, oppression, and then thirdly, we see in our consumerist culture ignorance. Ignorance. Rebecca Conadike de Young in her book, Glittering Vices, writes this. Whatever era we live in, we might be so formed by greed that we consider our current condition normal. And we can't see why we would need more than minor lifestyle adjustments, scaling back our most egregious excesses to address this vice. Our greed has become both mundane and comfortable. Greed isn't something we often don't notice or think about because it's just the water we swim in. If you were born in the 80s, you probably remember that movie, uh, Wall Street, and you remember there's a famous line in that movie that Michael Douglas says, greed is good. And he's basically saying that the company that he works for survives off of greed. It's sort of the water we swim in. For many of us, all we've known is consuming and with very little thought or experience on the production side, when we get our groceries, we never really stop to ask, where do the eggs or milk come from? In our culture, we have hidden production, how things are produced in many cases, and put all the attention on having the product. Everywhere you go, there's an advertisement trying to convince you. I talked about that earlier on my trip to the gas station this morning. But as you're driving down the road, you'll see billboards. You turn on the radio station, you hear commercials. Companies have gone to great measures to inundate us with ads and market products. Many, in many cases, we just don't need. And when they've sold us a product, they come up with a new version and convince us that we need to buy the new version. Think about this uh, with razor blades, right? First you had the one-blade razor. Then you had the two-blade razor. But then you, now you need the three. We're actually up to how many? We're up to five, I think, right now. Uh, and is that because we really have advanced the razor over the years? Or is it another reason to buy more? Am I, am I touching any, on any nerves right now? Am I poking on anybody, because I'm feeling it myself. This is really deeply in our culture. In some, some of our hearts, this may feel prickly. But I want to, again, just invite you for a second 
to listen to the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit speaking to you in this? We have in American consumerism a system of production that depends on making products that will soon be replaced by a newer version or a newer style of that product. We, how can we be content with an iPhone 14 when an iPhone 15 is coming out in a few weeks? And then I own that probably we can't actually use our old phone because the operating system has changed, so we have to buy it anyway. So there's that. There's this planned obsolescence going on that's driving a lot of our economics. Again, William Cavanaugh in his book says, the economy as it is currently structured would grind to a halt if we ever looked at our stuff and simply declared, it's enough, I'm happy with what I have. Let me say that again. Our economy would grind to a halt if we were content with what we had. Happiness or contentment is sometimes exactly what we lose by giving in to a consumerist identity and culture. Nothing is ever enough. We always need to buy something else. We can never get rid of this restless feeling, and because we always need to consume more, we're never full. We can never quite reach contentment. Well, brothers and sisters, that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be at peace. God made us to be whole and well, not sick with craving and greed, and he's shown us the way. In the book of Philippians that Casey read a few moments ago in chapter 4, I want you to, I want you to have your Bibles open again to chapter 4 of Philippians, because we're going to look at what God is showing us here about this identity and how to think about it. God is giving us power and strength and wisdom to address the forces of consumerism in our culture. And we can see this here in the example of Paul and the church in Philippi. Paul wrote this letter from prison. We're not sure where. It could have been Rome. It could have been Ephesus. But he was in prison when he wrote it. And part of the reason Paul is writing to the church in Philippi is to thank them for their support. He's in prison. And in that time, you, if you were in prison, you depended upon your friends and family to come and bring you your basic needs. And so the church in Philippi had actually sent a person, Epaphroditus, had sent this man on their behalf to bring him food, to bring him uh, things that he needed and to meet his basic needs. And so part of the reason he's writing this letter is to thank them for that. And he says in verse 18, I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. The church in Philippi actually reminds us a lot of, or reminds me a lot of our church here. This is a generous church. If you just think back to the last, even the last year, and how this church has given to the needs of our city, to the needs of, of other countries like Haiti, and, and our, with our partner churches there, it's really cool to think about the generosity that God is stirring up in our church and has been doing so for many years. And I think that our church is very much like this church in Philippi in its generosity. Also, in the love that this church showed for each other. They loved each other. They were generous with, with what they had, but they weren't perfect. They weren't perfect. They're like us. They were tempted to worry, tempted to be concerned. They might not have enough at the end of the day, and that, that maybe they needed more. They needed more. And so Paul is going to address this with them, and I think that it's really applicable to us. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to see, in fact, three ways that we can replace the lies of consumerism with his truth. And the first lie that I want us to think about is this. Just a little more, and you'll be happy. Just a little more, and you'll be happy. This is a lie against true joy. The truth is, we don't find joy in having more things or experiences. We find joy in knowing God. But with, with all Satan's temptations, it works like this. Satan tempts us by putting a little bit of the truth within the lie. What rings true about the lie that just a little more and you'll be happy is that we need more than what the fallen world can give us. And we all feel that. We all feel we do need more. The lie comes in in where we find it. In his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, C.S. Lewis describes how he became a follower of Jesus. He says that up until becoming a Christian, his life was just marked by a search for joy, for a search for happiness. 
It describes moments growing up um, and then on into adulthood where these little flashes of joy would hit him. He describes being a little kid and him and his brother playing uh, with these, these, like, kind of making their own fairy garden, little garden. You ever done that? You ever taken, like, moss and dirt and leaves and sticks and made a little, like, fort or garden out of it? He talks about that with his brother, and there was something about that that was just magical to him and gave him this glint of just contentment and joy in the simple thing of play. Later on in his adult life, he talks about looking over the craggy, uh, mountainous areas of Ireland, his home country, and just being caught for a second with a moment of beauty and longing for that, longing to keep that moment in his heart. And for Lewis, he was an avid reader, so poetry would sometimes also capture him. For some of us, maybe it's a moment of seeing an amazing sports play, seeing some athletic thing done with incredible ability and skill. And we just take, we have a glimpse of something beyond what we currently have that we long for. Lewis later uh, is reflecting on, on these experiences he had, and he wrote this. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. What the New Testament teaches us is that the other world that we're longing for, beyond this one, what the New Testament actually teaches is that it has come. Throughout Paul's letters, he is trying to get us to see the kingdom has come. Jesus has brought it. And it's not somewhere far away now, but for followers of Jesus, it's right here. As we experience life together with one another in church, what we're actually doing is we're, we're experiencing the Holy Spirit, the power of heaven come through us. And in the love that we share and the sacrifices that we make for one another, that's heaven breaking in into our world. We have the Holy Spirit not only working through us, but living in us. This is what Jesus came to bring. And Paul will say that for us who are in Christ Jesus, everything is a new creation. We are a new creation. And this world is being made new. If you look at verse 5, I think we get a little glimpse of this from Paul. In the end of that verse, Paul says, the Lord is at hand, or the Lord is near. And I don't think what he's meaning there is the Lord's about to come back, his second coming is about to happen, and get rid of it. I think actually what he's saying is, no, the Lord is with us. He's right here. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. He is with us. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 28, uh, in the Great Commission, he said, behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Some of us so much think of God, we think of heaven as a faraway place removed from us. And the image of heaven in the scripture is of an exalted place that is far above us and our thoughts and our ways. But the thing that Jesus said he did is he brought heaven near. He brought heaven to us. And so it is not far from those who follow Jesus. We say, yes, but Jesus is on the throne in heaven, and heaven's a long way away. Well, if we talk like that, we may as well be like anyone else in the world without God and just resign ourselves to getting a little more down here to try to fill our happiness. But the truth is, for us, there is a new creation, and Jesus is here with us. I like to think of in prayer. This helps me a lot. When I'm praying, I like to actually imagine that Jesus is standing beside me or he's sitting there with me because he is with us. It's okay to use your imagination if that scares you a little bit because Jesus said, I am with you. And in fact, go look this story up. I don't have time to tell you. Look at Acts 23 and the story of Paul. He's in, he's, he's, he's in prison a lot, Paul is. He likes to get himself there. But look at that story. He's in prison in Jerusalem, just like Jesus. He was arrested in Jerusalem. He's there at nighttime by himself. And guess what happens? It says, the Lord stood by him. The Lord stood by him and spoke and comforted Paul. The Lord is always with us. And sometimes he opens up our eyes to see that in even greater ways. The Lord is at hand. There's no greater encouragement than having the King of Kings standing by your side. And we do. We have him always with us. 
till our last breath. Rejoice in the Lord, Paul says. Again, I will say rejoice. And if, that was, if there's anything you take from the sermon, take that. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let's not be anxious for anything, but pray. And by praying, let's come into God's presence. His peace will guard our hearts and minds. So, second lie that I want to address is this. As long as you pay for it, you shouldn't be limited from buying whatever you want. As long as you pay for it, you shouldn't be limited from buying whatever you want. This one, it gets a little dicey, so I'm going to ask you to please hang with me. Are you with me? Are you hanging with me right now? Listen, listen to this. This lie that as long as we pay for it, we really can get whatever we want is a lie against true freedom. And in our society, the word freedom has come to mean no restraints. If you're free, no one's holding you back. No one's restraining you. To be free is supposedly to have no limits placed on us from doing whatever we want to do. And sadly, this is pretty much the idea of freedom that runs a lot of our consuming today. People should be free, that is, without constraint from anyone telling them what they should do with their money, to go buy something else as long as both the buyer and the seller agree on what they're doing. So I go to the mall. I go to my favorite store. I pick out a shirt. I take it to the register. I pay the salesperson the agreed upon price, and I take the shirt home. That's a free exchange of goods. I know what I'm getting. I'm getting this shirt. I know what I'm paying price was clearly on the label, and no one is forcing me to make this purchase. That's what we do in a free market economy. What's required in our system is the buyer and the seller are informed about what's being exchanged, the product and the price, and they make that exchange without anyone forcing them to. And in many ways, this is a very good system. This keeps us as a society safe from many forms of oppression. But if we blindly believe that it always benefits everyone involved, we're deceiving ourselves and falling victim to the consumerist lie that as long as we pay for it, we should be able to buy what we want. This is a lie against true freedom. When it comes to consuming, true freedom is not freedom to consume or buy what I want, but freedom to consume what is good for me and in a way that is good for others. Now, I'm speaking here as a Christian. For a Christian, if I'm thinking according to heaven's system of values, when I make a purchase or consume something, my, I know deep down what I really want this thing to do is to bring me closer to God, to help me rejoice in the Lord always. That's what I want everything in my life, whether I drink, eat, or drink, or whatever I do. I want it to be for God's glory and my good, but not just my good. I want this thing that I'm consuming or purchasing to also actually help others to benefit those involved in this. What Jesus is bringing to the world through his people is what he calls shalom, the word our Bibles translate as peace. Shalom is not this watered down kind of peace like, okay, things are settled now, you know, settled down now, the house is quiet, the kids have gone to bed, it's it's peaceful. That's not what peace is according to the scriptures. That's just a very low grade, watered down quality of peace. Real peace, real shalom is where things and people are whole and flourishing. It's where the mom and dad and the parents are having that beautiful, you know, Disney movie moment, that Hallmark moment, and everybody's happy and all is right in the world. But in a way that we can hardly imagine because shalom is that moment when all things in the world are working as God designed them. And in terms of trade and economics, shalom is where there's not only the freedom to make exchanges with with one another, but where those exchanges truly benefit and lead everyone involved to God's love and love with each other. So go back to the store with me for a second. We're back at the store. We're we're buying that shirt that I I want to get. If I walked into that store and made a truly free purchase, a purchase that leads to more shalom in the world, here's what it might look like. I go to the shelf and find a shirt to wear because clothing, I know, is a gift from God, a gift that protects me from things like wind and rain, and that also adorns the body for beauty. The shirt will help me experience more of God's blessing in these and other ways. It's not a shirt, by the way, 
that's made from bad materials, uh, but good materials that are good for my body to wear. As I walk to the cashier, I thank God for providing the money to purchase this, this clothing, and I get to wear it. But in a truly free purchase, I also know that buying this shirt will not only benefit me, but everyone else involved. Everyone else. Not just the cashier whose job it is to receive the payment on behalf of the store, but the other workers who work at that store. Those who own the store. But of course, in our day and age, rarely is a store a place where also that product is being made. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. And I have to remember that there are, there are other people involved. There's the people who sewed the garment. A truly free purchase will benefit them too, bringing shalom to them. There's the producers of the fabric, but even before that, whether that's cotton or wool or some other material, they should also benefit. Now let me ask you, with all these folks involved and all the work they have to do, work that results in high quality clothing that protects and adorns me for my real benefit, what should I be willing to pay? If you're like me, your first question when you go into a store or look for something is, huh, how much does it cost? What's the price? What if our question instead were, what's the impact of this purchase? What's the impact of this thing? Will buying this do me good? Will buying this do the producers good and everyone involved? Will buying this thing do the earth good? Paul says in verses 8 and 9, look there with me. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The lie is this, as long as you pay for it, you shouldn't be limited from buying whatever you want. But the truth is that we are called to practice consuming in a way that is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, and all the rest. The lie is that we should buy what we want and that, for some of us, a cheap purchase is a good purchase automatically. But the truth is that making a good purchase takes more effort, that we should buy in a way that helps increase shalom for us and everyone involved. So here's just a few examples that may apply. Try buying used instead of new. Buy used instead of new. Buy only what you believe. This is maybe the best one. Buy only what you believe to be truly useful, beautiful, and good. Useful, beautiful, and good. And then here's, a, here's one. One of our practices that we do at our church is fasting. Fasting is a way for us to say no to one thing that is a good thing so we can make more space in our hearts to experience God. So maybe try fasting from shopping from things that you don't, that you don't absolutely need. Third point. We're coming to a close here. And the third lie I want to look at is you can have whatever money can buy. You can have whatever money can buy. This is a lie against the true God. Money is not God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the consumerist identity treats money as if it's God. I have money, therefore I have strength. But as followers of Jesus, our strength comes not from having more of anything else, but from belonging to Jesus. We feed on him, and he strengthens us. He says, my blood is true drink, my body is true bread. What he's saying is, I am your life. I will satisfy your thirst. And this is what Paul is telling us in verse 12 and 13. That secret, right? He's learned the secret of contentment. What is the secret? I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In, every, in, every, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, obedi- uh, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The secret is not some uh, 
nugget of wisdom, by the way, that, that we're going to somehow find out. It's actually through experience that you learn this. Paul had to go through the experience of hunger, of being hungry but not getting fed that day. He had to go through the experience also of having people in his life supply him with lavish banquets. I mean, Jesus came and enjoyed good food and good drink, and all Christians should be welcome to that as well. But there will be times of abundance as well as times of hunger. And Paul says the secret is you go through those experiences and you know it's not the abundance and it's not the hunger that counts, but it's the strength. Where does the strength come from? It comes from knowing and being known by Jesus. And as we close, I want to tell you a a little story about a guy named George Mueller. George Mueller is just one of my heroes. He lived in the 1800s in Prussia, modern-day Germany. And early on, George Mueller, as, as a boy and as a teenager, he was a thief, he was a liar, and he was an alcoholic. He drank all the time. His father was a government official who was a tax collector, and so his father would often have in his office money that he'd been collecting. George, just, to ha- just for kicks, would steal money that his father had collected and go in- and spend you know, the government's money. Uh, and then George's father would have to uh, pay for that. He, he didn't you know, let George get in trouble. His father would cover for him. And this was kind of his, George's uh, M.O., In his 20s, George was sent to seminary, of all places, to become a Lutheran minister, Uh, not because he wanted to serve the church or serve God, uh, but because he wanted to uh, have a stable and comfortable living. As a minister, that's in the Lutheran church, you, you could have that. During a summer holiday, he and his friends traveled to Switzerland, and they were doing kind of just what, what, you know, you might expect on a, on a summer trip. They're going to the best restaurants they, they can. They're, they're seeing the Alps. They're enjoying themselves. But one evening, uh, one of his friends invited him to go to a Bible study. And George goes along. And by the way, I forgot to mention that during this trip, George was actually stealing from his friends uh, <laughs> while they were on this trip. Um, so that, yeah. But, but he goes to, with his friend to a Bible study. And... At this Bible study, George sees people praying and singing to God. And, and one of the things he noticed was they were on their knees a lot, just praising God on their knees. And he's like, I've never seen anyone worship God like this. What is happening? And he heard people studying the scriptures, talking about the Lord. He, he heard a sermon. But that experience for him left him just with a jaw-dropping moment. And he said to his friends afterwards as they were kind of debriefing the night, he's like, Everything we have seen on our journey to Switzerland and all our former pleasure are nothing in comparison with this evening. His life changed that night. George had come into the presence of God and everything was different. A radical shift happened. George not only stopped stealing, but his whole outlook on money and life was different. He got married. He moved to Bristol, England. And he and his wife would learn to pray whenever they needed things as a newly married couple. They'd pray. George became a missionary. He gave up the comfortable ministerial life and took a a little bit different track, but he went into ministry all the same. And as he was preaching in Bristol, he noticed all these children, all these orphans on the streets. And God moved his heart in generosity to say, we're going to help these orphans. And so hundreds of girls and boys were provided a place to live as George... uh, started these orphanages. Now, the first orphanage he started, he had 50 cents in his pocket. And somehow, miraculously, God brought in the funds to start it. And that was just the MO now for George. Whenever he had a need, he and his wife would get on their knees and they would bring it to God. And George kept a little journal of all the things that he prayed for. And you can go and see this in his autobiography. He talks about this journal. And he would write down everything that needed, down to the penny. And he would see God again and again provide for every need. There's one amazing story I just love to, to, to tell. One day, the children had sat down for breakfast, and there was no more food. They had run out the food uh, the day before at the orphanage. George and his wife had known that the food had run out, but as was the custom, they all sat down to eat, and they all sat down to pray and thank God for the food that was about to be provided. Well, right on cue, someone knocks on the front door. And who is it? It's the baker. Why are you here? Well, I woke up last night, I couldn't sleep, 
And I just felt like God was telling me, go bake bread. And so I did. I made bread. And then I realized it was because he wanted the kids to have this. So here you go. Well, as the baker finishes telling his story, they get another knock on the door. And who is it? It's the milkman. What are you doing here? Well, my cart just broke down. And I've got all this milk. And I want the children to have it so it doesn't spoil. And, and so the day's needs were provided for. And the children had just what they needed. George's orphanages, really God's orphanages, provided those kids a warm, safe place to live until they were old enough that they could get a trade and a job and work for themselves. And I love the story of George Mueller because it shows that he had learned, like Paul, the secret of contentment. The secret of contentment. Mueller came to see that true joy and peace, true contentment, does not come from having a lot of stuff or a nice savings account, but from daily trust in God's provision, whether the day provided just enough, some bread and milk, or an abundance. He saw how to face plenty or hunger, and he knew where true strength came from. So the lie again, you can have whatever money can buy. We need to confront with the truth that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Following Christ means we get our power from him. Power and strength for each day doesn't come from food or clothing or having enough of anything else. Our power comes from consuming something the world cannot give, consuming actually the life of God that he freely gives us. The life of God is there for us eternally. Jesus says he's a fountain that never runs out. He is bread that gives eternal life. And in a moment, we're going to take communion. And communion symbolizes and shows that truth to us. But before we do that, I actually want to introduce seven young people who are going to follow Jesus today by getting baptized. They're showing that they are following him. So I want to invite those young people to actually come on and make their way to the stage with their families. These seven young people have decided to follow Christ, and today they are symbolically declaring that decision with baptism. Baptism is a sacred, symbolic act that shows a person has left the way of sin behind and is following instead the way of the kingdom of heaven, the way of Jesus. It means that the person no longer belongs to the kingdom to this world, but to Christ's kingdom. And it means that the person has accepted God's grace to receive Jesus as their Savior who died for their sins. That this act also shows that we are raised to new life with Christ. As he lives forever, so will we. And also that the Holy Spirit has come into the hearts of these young people. And now now God is living on the inside of them. They are sons and daughters of God. All of this, the beautiful symbol of baptism, shows us. And as I've told them in the class that they took recently, I want them, every time they get in a shower, (laughs) every time they wash their hands, every time water is splashed on them, I want it to be a reminder to you of this day that God has cleansed you, that God has brought you from death to life with him. So, uh, I'm going to say the names of these beautiful people, and um, as, as I say your name, would you mind just raising your hand for me so people can know who you are? Haley Rose Hess. Oh, hi. Raise, raise it high, Haley Rose. There you are. Okay. Lainey Houck. There's Lainey. Sam Croman. There's Sam. Ellie Lindhart. Where did Ellie go? There she is. A.J. Snyder. Elise Snyder, brother and sister, and Cora T. Meyer. And actually, you're all brothers and sisters now in Jesus. And I'm going to ask you all three questions. And after I say each question, you can all respond together your answer, okay? So here are the questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you affirm that it is by grace alone that you have been saved? And do you commit to walk in your identity as a son or daughter of God? Amen. Amen. All right, now we're going to take communion, and then uh, I'm going to take this crew, and we're going to get ready to be bapt- uh, for them to be baptized. 
Uh, communion is for those who follow Jesus. Like baptism, it is a sacred symbol. And communion symbolizes the life of God given to us through Jesus. So again, those who are serving communion, you can come forward. Um, and in a moment, we'll take it. The cup that you will drink from, or that you will dip in, the cup means that God loves us and has poured out his life on our behalf. The bread means that God wants to feed us with eternal life so we will have joy forever with him. So come, brothers and sisters, let's thank God for this meal. Let's pray. Our, our Father, we thank you for these young people behind me that they get to take of this meal as part of the family of Jesus, your family, our Father. We thank you that when we say yes to Jesus, we don't just get you as our Father, at, which is as awesome as that is, Lord, but we get brothers and sisters. We get a new family. Thank you for this meal that we enjoy together as a family, the meal that reminds us, Jesus, of what you've done on the cross on our behalf. So bless us in it, God, and strengthen us through your life, the life of God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you to come and take communion.